if you were ever wondering why your period might be different than your best friends or what your period really means about your hormones and your fertility, then wow, do I have the episode for you. So stay tuned and keep watching. So today I have the honor and privilege of interviewing and bringing to all of you some amazing information provided by one of my friends and colleagues and all around fabulous woman extraordinaire, Nicole Jardim. Nicole is a certified women's health coach. She is a functional nutrition coach. And aside from that, as of today, she is the author of an amazing book with tons of resources that is really going to educate all of you watching and listening today. It's called Fix Your Period. So Nicole, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you here, not only because I love talking to you and uh, learning from you, but more importantly, because you have such an important thing to share with everybody, this amazing book called Fix Your Period, which everybody needs to get. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, no, I will say everybody, because I think it's actually just as important for men as it is for for women, um, you know, especially those who are married to understand their their loved ones and and what they do and and what they're going through, but more importantly, to be able to support them properly. So thanks so much for writing the book and for being here with me. (laughs) Thank you so much, Mark. I love that. I feel like I need to just hang out with you every morning. (laughs) 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 Major ego boost over here. (laughs) Well, look, it's um, when I got the book in the mail, I was really excited and um, I opened it up and started looking through it and reading through it. And there's such important, valuable information in there to share with everybody. So I think it's a blessing to have it for everyone to have. But um, I want to start with what was the spark that caused you to want to write something like this? Oh, my gosh. Do you have all day? I mean, <laughs> it was one of those. It's one of these lifelong journeys. You know what I mean? But ultimately, it much of this just stems from my own period related issues as a teenager and in my early 20s and being on the birth control pill for five years and having, you know, basically being the poster child for birth control side effects, as well as poster child for period problems when I was a teenager. But essentially, all of that culminated in me doing this work. And I remember a number of years ago, uh, my agent, uh, my now agent reached out to me and she had been, we'd been connected through another friend of ours. And She was like, haven't you thought about writing a book? And I was just like, you know, because writing a book is a serious undertaking, as you well know. And I I never imagined what it would be like. It it reminds me of what it's like when your friends tell you what labor is like. You don't really know till you know. So basically, um, like I said, a couple of years ago, I decided, okay, I'm going to do this thing. And it was almost as much for me as it was for everyone else because my 21 year old self could not get answers. I could, I had all of these problems. They were sort of seemingly unrelated problems. And I saw many different doctors and nobody really could connect the dots. And I remember just not being able to get answers to what was wrong, reasons why I had all of these issues, much less solutions that were not the pill or let's wait and see or try some other medication. And so that was really what the first part of the book was actually dedicated to is menstrual cycles 101. How do you even know what's normal, what's not? So that's, that's really where this came from. You know, it's, it's such a um, missing piece in our, you know, sex ed in school and there's so much misinformation and misunderstanding. and And I can't tell you how often I hear, I'm sure you're the same is, you know, patients reach out to me and say, you know, I didn't know that about my period or I didn't understand how it worked. I mean, I thought I did, but I never really questioned it. You know, they had all these either assumptions or or misunderstandings. And I think just kind of resetting the foundation of, of menstrual education is so, so valuable. So if there was one thing that you had to say to somebody watching about why it's so important for them to re-educate themselves on their menstrual cycle, what would you say? I would say that it's not about it. I mean, it is, but it isn't about fertility because they're both intertwined. And so they're not mutually exclusive. And so when we're talking about our menstrual cycles, 
what I think the most important thing to know is that you have to establish your norm because your period might be different to your best friend's period. And that's okay. But I think there are some parameters. For instance, you know, I love to see a menstrual cycle somewhere between 25 and 35 days long. And if it's outside of those windows, usually there's something going on. Usually you're ovulating, you're ovulating too early in the cycle if you have a short cycle or you're ovulating too late or later on in your cycle if your period comes late after 35 days. The other thing is a period that lasts three to seven days is also ideal. Like we want to see something in there. And if it's less than that, or if it's longer than that, that's indicative of something's going on with your hormones or your sex hormones that you need to investigate further. And not only that too, like how heavy your period is, how light it is, all of these symptoms are information for you to learn from your body. So it's really reflective of your overall health. It's not just some random thing that happens to you. Your body is not just rebelling against you because it decided that it doesn't like you anymore. You know, it's like really important for us to remember that our periods are, are definitely indicative of underlying issues happening and they're not, you know, they're just not random. Yeah. You know, that is such an important piece because I think the mentality is to isolate everything and, and compartmentalize everything. Yes. And um, I think, you know, I've, I've often t- talked to patients how, how beautiful it is that women have a menstrual cycle and how valuable it is that women have a menstrual cycle. There's such these negative connotations around it that, Oh, I should feel shitty. It should be painful. It's normal to have tons of cramps and big clots and it's normal to have a light flow or it's normal now because of birth control to not have a period at all. We don't need it. Right. That they're told. Right. So, and I hear all these things and we have all this misinformation either by your OBGYN or your mother or sister or best friend who you're just comparing yourself to somebody else who has, you know, a not a normal or correct cycle. And so that's what you're creating as normal. I often tell them, look, it's, it's a beautiful thing to have this happen because it tells you so much information, so much valuable information every month if you use it right. But I think we've gotten into this place where we don't want a period anymore. We don't want to ovulate or we're told that they're not necessary. So yes, let's go backwards and say, why do you think it's so important for women to one, have a regular period and two, have a normal, regular ovulation? Well, I think this is so great because this really addresses the root of the problem that I see in our society. And it's that uh, menstrual cycles are optional. And that's a huge issue because ovulation is such a vital process in our bodies. And yet we're perpetually told that it's, it's optional. You can just turn that off and then turn it right back on when you're ready to have kids. And that, as you well know, that is not the case. And so what I think is so interesting is that back in 2005, I believe it was the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research and I know everyone's like, wait, that exists. Yes, it actually exists. We research menstrual cycles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they did a, um, a scientific forum called the, it's like a, the menstrual cycle is a vital sign, something along those lines. And then in 2015, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology actually stated that the your period is a vital sign. I mean, there is incredible scientific literature around Uh, ovulation is a sign of health, your menstrual cycle is a vital sign. Meaning when we say vital sign, we're talking about like your pulse and your blood pressure and your body temperature. You know, it's kind of necessary, which is amazing. And what is so unfortunate, I think, is that conventionally speaking, we're ignoring all of that incredible evidence that shows that it is so clear that women, this process in a woman's body is a vital part of her overall health. That, reg- that regular ovulation is tied to our health and our fertility. And, bec- and the reason for that is because when you're ovulating consistently, you're making hormones that your body wouldn't necessarily make in the- at those levels. And so it's almost like you're depositing hormones into your hormone savings account. Because as we well know too, everything that happens in your teens, your 20s, your 30s is going to impact you in your 40s, 50s and beyond. And, you know, and so we really have to be cognizant of that. It's not like you can just 
you know, totally ditch all of the things, eating well, taking care of your health with exercise and stress management and whatnot, and just hope for the best. <laughs> it's, you can, but it's not advisable. And so ovulation that occurs on a consistent basis is the driver for these sufficient levels of uh, estradiol. So that's your body's main form of estrogen. Progesterone, which is a key female sex hormone, and testosterone as well, because testosterone rises with estradiol right before ovulation. And so these hormones are not just about fertility like we've been led to believe. They are so, they play such an important role in other areas of our health, like our bone health. For instance, girls who have been on birth control for a long period of time, what they're finding in the research is that they have osteopenia and they're at risk of osteoporosis in their 20s. I mean, that is crazy. So estradiol, bone health, um, progesterone, brain health, cognitive function, moods, uh, as well as your also bone health, but also your skin, your hair, your heart health. So we are essentially turning off this process that is a driver for the production of these hormones that influence not only our menstrual cycle and fertility, but all of these other aspects of our health. And then that's why when you're on the pill, for instance, or you're not ovulating consistently, you have all of these, what I was saying before, seemingly unrelated symptoms. Yeah. I love the way you said, well, there's so many things in my mind swirling about what you said that I want to touch on if I can, rem if I can catch them all. But the one thing that really stuck out to me is looking at your health as a bank account. Yes. Or your, you know, even your menstrual cycle as a bank account and that you're trying to deposit funds in and save them. Like it should even be like a savings account, you know, that mm -hmm. you're trying to store this up over time and trying to balance that out with life and, and all these other circumstances that, that come our way. And I think that's a, such a valuable way for people to think about it because they're told that when you want to get pregnant, uh, all you do, just get off the pill. You're going to stay on the pill. When you're ready, you come off and you should be just fine when you're ready to go. And, and so they, they don't think about it in this like normal process, this normal way, because that's the mentality that they have because that's what they've been taught. And so yeah. this like bank account mentality of like, oh, I've got to actually save up. So that way, when I'm ready to have a baby, I can actually just make that switch and use the deposits that have been put into my account to then work in my favor. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And I think that if we can not see, uh, you know, these, these, our health in such a siloed way, right? Because that's really one of the biggest problems, right? Yeah. Is that we're just not looking at all of the interconnectedness. And when you think about hormones in general, and the fact that, you know, they're all communicating with each other all day, every day. They're yeah. literally responsible for everything. It's not like hormones just kicked in right when, you know, puberty started and, or when you're ready to have a baby or something, or, or you get your period. It's that they've been, they've been there the whole time doing all of these things, serving us. But when you think about hormones in general, we don't, they don't have a good reputation, right? I mean, <laughs> right? I, it's usually like, I'm so hormonal or, you know, I'm so bitchy this month or whatever. It's always your hormones, but yet they are constantly working for us. And so I think that we really have to do a bit of a switcheroo on how we view our, the, our hormones and how they work in our bodies, because they're actually, I mean, they're just responsible basically for everything, how you feel, your mood, your sleep, your menstrual cycle, your sex drive, your hunger, everything. Yeah, hormones are so important and they do get a bad rap, but they have so much value and um, and they're so vital to our overall health, which is why I love how you broke it down in the book, you know, the different tiers or levels of the yeah. I thought that was great, a really nice explanation for people because most people just don't understand that. But when I ha when I have patients who come in to start to talk to me about their fertility, they yeah. always start with their fertility. So this is what I've been going through and we've been trying for 12 months and we haven't been able to get pregnant and we've tried these supplements and this is typically where they start, right? Or we've gone to see this fertility doctor for an IUI or IVF and I always have to stop them and backtrack. I said, okay, so what I, where I want to start is tell me about your menstrual cycle. Right. I want to understand what your period, what your menstrual cycle is like. So can you talk a little bit about, because I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing me talk about the same thing. So <laughs> can you talk a little bit about why your whole cycle is so important and why that's valuable for fertility? 
Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that you said that. It's so true. We usually just, just start with the, in the moment, right? What's happening to us right now. And why is this happening to me? And I, you know, I think that we, I, I do want to preface this by saying that there's a bit of evolutionary mismatch happening for female bodies, especially. And we are now living in a time that doesn't really work for our fertility so much. It doesn't really work for our cycles and our unique hormonal balance. And as a result, uh, you know, we're sort of swimming upstream a bit. And so we're, you know, a female body is so keenly attuned to stressors or external stressors. And that's a great thing. Excellent survival mechanism. Not so great for 2020, especially right now when we're in a pandemic. <laughs> so great. Um, because obviously we're just, our hypothalamus is on high alert. It's just like scanning everything. And we're just like, oh my God, this is crazy. So what I will say is that even on a good day, that's still happening. And as a result, our bodies are, like I said, so keenly attuned to this stress or aware of it that we ultimately end up um, you know, being much more stressed than we should be. And that completely shuts down our menstrual cycle and ultimately our fertility. And so that's really where I think so many of us run into problems. And, you know, with that said, as that relates to these, you know, four phases of your menstrual cycle and, and how all of your hormones that interplay is all happening, uh, you know, we, we really have to start with when you're getting what you, what your period looks like and then, you know, and how ovulation is happening. And so with, when you think about, that first phase of your cycle, that's menstruation, uh, you know, you're really looking, like I was saying before, for those three to seven day, that three to seven day window. And then also symptoms that have been perpetually normalized in our society are for us, you and I, major red flags. Mm -hmm. How much pain are you experiencing? Are, are you in pain? And if you are in pain, is it disruptive to your life? And, um, you know, are you just taking a couple of Advil or painkillers every cycle or are you taking half a bottle? And, you know, all of these nuances, I think, are so important for us to pay attention to because ultimately, you know, I want everyone to be their own period detective and, and start to figure out, like, what's not right. The problem that I feel like we run into as well is that we'll go to the doctor and a lot of these symptoms that are that you and I would not consider normal and would be indicative of a possible fertility issue or something else going on is, you know, is considered normal in mainstream medicine. And so we run into that and we'll go to the doctor for years for painful periods. And for whatever reason, we're, you know, we're dismissed, we're told that it's potentially all in our heads, or we're given another medication, we're sent on our way, whatever it is. And that's why, you know, it's funny, that's why I actually may put all of those problems on a wheel on the cover of my book, because we don't even know what's normal and what's for not. For everyone who wants to see it. I know, right? My uterus is trying to kill me. That is, I've heard that many times. And I think that, you know, it's interesting because the UK publisher wanted to change the cover and make it completely nondescript. And I was like, but women don't even know the problems to begin with. So they need to know there's a problem in order to start to solve the problem. Yeah. And that we, it's a paradigm shift that needs to happen. And so if you're, you're, you're experiencing pain and you're being dismissed for years on end, and that potentially means, you know, you might have endometriosis or even adenomyosis or some other condition um, that will hinder your fertility later on down the line. By the time they get to you, there's, you know, there's been a decade worth of, of problems that have just been ignored. And so we really, I feel like we have to start from such a young age. And I'm just so hopeful that younger girls and women will start to shift their belief system around their cycle. And so coming back to the symptoms, like I was saying, some of the key ones I feel that are so important for us to remember is period pain. If it's disrupting your life, then you 100% need to look deeper at that. And I've covered so much of that in the book and on my blog. And I know you talk about this too. And I think the other thing is that I've heard a lot about as it relates to fertility is spotting before your period. And, you know, this is a key factor. We actually have a mutual friend who spotted before her period for years and couldn't get pregnant. And she was in her twenties. And she, you know, she said, she kept saying to her doctor, I really feel like there's something here. And of course she had low progesterone, but it was never addressed. And she ended up doing IVF to try and get pregnant because 
that that I mean, again, I can't say for sure that that was the one thing, but it was just that she was living super stressed. I mean, she wasn't eating well at all. She wasn't eating for her fertility and she had no idea. She was not really tracking her cycle either, but she knew that she was spot for 10 days before her period. So if you're spotting before your period, that's almost a sure sign of progesterone deficiency or another condition, um, you know, like endometriosis, for instance. So these are, you know, key red flags that we're not really taught to look at. And then with ovulation, um, nobody knows when they're ovulating. Yeah. <laughs> I have this conversation sure. a lot. And two of the ways to know that, and you can do this all on your own, which is what's so incredible, is that you don't need medical intervention for this, is taking your basal body temperature, which is your temperature first thing upon awakening, and tracking your cervical fluid patterns because your cervix is highly dependent on hormones and it will change according to hormone fluctuations, you know, during that second and third phase of your cycle. So again, it's like basic things like this, like I said, periods one-on-one that people just don't, just aren't even aware of. Through no fault of our own, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, look, I think that's so valuable for everybody listening because when I have this conversation and I start talking about they start talking about fertility and I bring it back to their periods and say, well, the place for us to start is to regulate your cycle and regulating yes. your cycle means that it should, you know, have an easy flow of three to seven days. It should be bright red with no spotting and no clots and no pain. And you should ovulate. You should have a healthy um, lead up to your period without much PMS at all. Okay. It shouldn't be major. Then you should start without any pain. So they look at me with, you know, like I'm an alien, like this is normal. Like women actually can do this. And so one, everyone should know women abs absolutely can do that. And that is the goal that we're striving for. Two, if we're able to achieve that, then we've also been able to achieve regulating your hormone balancing your cycles and supporting your overall health and that makes fertility and getting pregnant so much easier yeah. but like you mentioned if you've got a decade of all of this other stuff leading up to it and now you're trying to get pregnant we've got a lot of work to do to break that cycle right and to and to kind of press the reset button and get back to normal so it sometimes doesn't happen in two or three months it might take longer because we're trying to regulate things yes and get patients back totally. to where they are and you lay out a beautiful process that women who are reading can actually start to take control of this by starting this this process you break it down to six weeks but I was looking at it more like these are six steps where they have, whether they happen in six weeks or not to me, yeah. as I was reading through, it wasn't the, the more important piece. It was more like, these are the six steps that need to happen, hopefully over six weeks. But even if it's a little bit longer, that's it could be much longer. Fine. Yes, <laughs> I know. You know how it is with publishers. They're like, okay, four weeks, six weeks, what are we going to do here? So right. they, they feel like you have to have some kind of time frame. I agree with you. It is fully six steps and you could do it over six weeks. You could do it over six months, however you want to do it. I agree though, that sometimes these, this process takes longer and yeah. Anyway, keep going. I just wanted to say no, that because no, no. I feel like no, it's important. I wanted you to get into what those six steps are. So totally we break those down for everybody and maybe spend a little bit of time on, I know they're all important, but if you had to pick out one or two where you thought, Hey, let's really focus on these a little bit more than others. Let's do that as well. Yeah, I would love to. So for everyone who you know hasn't seen my table of contents, um, you know that first half of my book, I'm really breaking down, like I said, mapping your menstrual cycle. So you're really understanding what all is happening with it. And then in the the part two, I'm looking at it because I'm like, I better make sure I got these weeks right. <laughs> <laughs> But in part two, this is all about how do you actually fix these issues or address these issues. And I, you know, I always start with food. I know you do too. Food is our foundation. It, in many cases, is what we have the most control over. I recognize that now, in particular, a lot of us don't, and food is not readily available, or at least hormonal healthy hormone, hormonally healthy food is not available uh, at you know for most of us right now, or a lot of us. And but I will say that. One of the, I think that one of the best things we can do is figure out how to, what I say in the book, make our plate. And I have always been a fan of 
moving, you know, at least in the beginning, and this is pretty much for, for everyone across the board, but making meat be your side dish and the veggies sort of become the main, yeah, the star of the show. And so half of your plate being carbohydrates in the form of leafy green vegetables or other types of vegetables, cruciferous vegetables in particular, because many of us are estrogen dominant or have estrogen excess. And as a result, we need to really support our liver's ability to get those hormones out of our bodies. And that's one of the ways to do that is compounds known as DIM and sulforaphane in cruciferous veggies. So that's what I love to do. I love to have people set up half their plate with the veggies, a quarter with protein, and then a quarter with some kind of fat. And that really is to me the foundation for hormonal balance. And if we're able to do that as a start, you will start to see amazing results in just a few weeks. And you know, it's like one of those things where you know, like we, I think we all want immediate gratification. <laughs> and, you know, I, the other thing I would say as part of that first step is yes. Okay. So you're putting this amazing food on your plate, but are you actually chewing your food? Because that's the beginning of the digestive process. I feel like that's literally the, you know, it's the root cause of our digestive problems is not starting the first step with the, you know, chewing your food 20 to 30 times. So I, I ask people to, to consider that too. Start with the food and then start to chew your food and call me in two weeks and <laughs> tell me how you're feeling. Because I guarantee you will be feeling a lot better. Um, so that's that first part. And again, like if we go into real detail about certain nutrients that support hormones, that support your ovarian function and your period in general. Um, and then we move into step two or week two with blood sugar. And I know you know this, but oh my gosh, if there was anything that we should do, we should all do to get our hormones under control, it would be that. Because what we forget is insulin is a really powerful hormone. And like we were talking about earlier, the tiered system, I broke it down that way so that people could see that cortisol and insulin are the queen bee hormones. They will mess you up <laughs> if you're not paying attention to them. And so as a result with insulin, uh, you know, when your blood sugar is off in the way that it is for so many of us and that we are just, we're eating foods that are not in agreement with our metabolism, what tends to happen is insulin will throw off our ovarian hormones. So it, it definitely makes your ovaries produce more LH, which will be very problematic in the long term because there's a whole feedback loop happening. And if one hormone is off, the others will be too. And so that's, again, the interconnectedness. In addition to that, uh, insulin raises the activity of um, aromatase, which is an enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So again, this is a direct impact of our food and onto our hormones, our sex hormones. So if we're, we're getting our blood sugar under control uh, through, I have a seven day um, plan in there to just eat, to stabilize your blood sugar. And I also teach you how to prick your finger and test your own blood sugar. Because again, I feel like, knowledge is power. We need to give back our, we have to take back ownership of our health. I mean, because it's clearly not happening for the most part for many of us. And this is why people come to you. It's why they come to me. And so I think that the blood sugar is so critical. So with blood sugar, I think what, if the way to know if you're not going to prick your finger is to pay attention to how you feel after you eat. So I encourage everyone who's watching. So if you eat a meal, you know, in a couple hours or whatever, See how you feel. Do you feel exhausted? Do you feel like you literally were high on a high for a, you know, a couple of minutes and now you're literally wanting to fall asleep? Do you feel as though you're starving 30 to 60 minutes after you've eaten? Are you moody or hangry before you eat or after you eat? All of these are signs that your blood sugar is off. So pay attention to that and start to think about the plate thing that I said about five minutes ago. And then from there, moving into uh, week three, fix your gut. I mean, this is a whole thing. You know, I feel like whole books have been dedicated to fixing your gut health. They have. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Many books. And, uh, and so it's one of those things that I, originally that chapter was like 60 pages long. And they were like, Nicole, are you kidding me? This is obviously not going to work. Like create a course or something, but <laughs> it's not going to happen in here. So I had to really cut this thing down. It was so hard because as you well know, gut health is so multifaceted. But yeah. what I think the key thing is to remember for us, period, havers, is that estrogen is very much influenced by your gut. And so when you have a micro microbial imbalance, um, and it's you know way beyond the scope of this conversation, but essentially there is a there is a group of bacteria known as the estrobilome in your gut. And the estrobilome influences 
how much estrogen or how little estrogen you have, depending on what's going on with your estrobloom. And as a result, uh, what might happen is you recirculate estrogen from your gut if there is an imbalance there. Yeah. Or, yeah, or you don't make enough. I definitely am the type who doesn't seem to have enough estrogen because it just seems to just keep going. And I'm like, I really need some more. So, you know, it's really important for us to make sure that we're addressing what's going on with our gut health. And like I said, the chewing part of things is the first step. And then really, you know, and taking food out of your diet that is not helpful to you. And so I liken this and, you know, it's, it's an elimination diet. So I call it the fix your period elimination diet. We're taking out the foods that are most triggering to our, you know, into inflammation and just our health in general. And what I think is most important with this is that we're remembering that you can't see what's happening inside your gut, obviously. But if you had a cut on your arm and you just kept scratching it and scratching it, it would never heal. And that's essentially what those foods are doing to you if you just continue to eat them um, and expect that you're going to feel better when you're still having them. So that's part of week three, and it's a whole elimination diet that goes for 28 days. So it's basically the rest of the program. And then from there, we go into week four, your liver, the liver. I, it's amazing how people don't even realize how your liver is impacted or how your liver impacts your hormones. And um, so what I will say with that is that we have two phases of liver detoxification, phase one and phase two. Uh, your liver is essentially like your filter. It's gonna, if it's clogged up, you know what's gonna happen. Things yep. are either not going to go through or they're going to just spill right out back into your bloodstream. And so the goal is to keep all that stuff on the conveyor belt and let it keep going into phase three, which is your gut, and then out the door. And for many of us, you know, phase one and phase two is not, are not supported because we don't have the right nutrients. So things like selenium, the B vitamins, um, DIM and SGS, like I was just talking yep. about the cruciferous veggies, magnesium. So all of those nutrients, if they're deficient, what happens is your phases just break down, right? The conveyor belt stops, it halts, your stuff falls off, you know, all these issues happen. And then as a result, your hormones are, you know, going to eventually be out of whack because your liver is just not processing and breaking them down. And so we really have to support our liver. And I walk everyone through that, you know, different ways you can do that. And one of the biggest things is how can you limit the environmental toxins that you're exposed to? It's a huge one. It's so massive. And again, it's like your gut, it's completely unseen, right? You can't see BPA and you can't see phthalates. And yet they have an unbelievably profound effect on your ovarian function and your thyroid and your hormones in general. Um, so that I think is one of the critical components of, of hormone balancing. And then from there, we move into chronic overstimulation, how to address your stress. And I think what I would say that I really think that many of us are are making an effort to address our stress issues. What I don't, what I think we are struggling with is our perceived stress and or stressors that we don't think are even stressing us, like yeah. stress from childhood, whether that was abuse or neglect or something like that, that has changed our stress set point. Um, and I grew up in a very stressful childhood. My dad died when I was 11. So I can definitely relate to a lot of what women experience when um, they tell me that, you know, they feel like they have this heightened stress response. And what does that even mean? And where does that come from? And so it requires, it requires some digging. And it really requires some work on figuring out, you know, why is it that I respond to stress in this way? And, you know, and why do I perceive something as stressful when my husband or my friends don't think that's a stressful event, right? So it's sure. very much, I think it's a very, it's very nuanced in your, or you have to be nuanced in your approach to how you address stress. And then from there, we talk about thyroid. And another thing that I think is grossly underlooked is your thyroid and its implications for your period, your fertility. And one of the key components, I think, of this chapter is talking to women about subclinical hypothyroidism. I feel wow. like I'm going to get in some trouble there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just fully laid that out. I was like, well, it's a problem. And I feel like I need to call it out because... How many of us are walking around with subclinical hypothyroidism? And wow. right, it's it's unbelievable. I it's a huge percentage, and yet it's something that's really it's often overlooked or it's really not even recognized by mainstream medicine. And we're just sort of sent on our way. We're given a depression medication. Like I've heard that 
countless times, as I'm sure you have too. All the time. Right? And your thyroid, if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, your ovaries literally will not work properly. And, you know, it's like your ovaries require so much energy in order to ovulate. It's a very energy intensive operation. And as a result, if we, if our thyroid and our metabolism is not firing the way it's supposed to, we're going to have a problem. And yet we're, that commit connection is never made. And so I would say that, you know, that's the first thing is really get a full thyroid panel. And that's, that's what I, I recommend people do in that chapter, because you've got to figure out from that perspective, if it's your thyroid, that's, that's triggering the fertility and period problems that you're having. And in many cases, it's, th that's the only thing that's wrong. And once that's corrected, periods are restored. So I would say that that's, a summary of <laughs> everything. Oh my God. I'm going to stop. It's a, it, well, it's a great summary. I'm, I'm going to, there's some key things that I wrote down as you were talking that I just wanted to highlight for everybody. One is starting with the thyroid, because I often get this question from everybody because I spend a lot of time talking to patients about thyroid. They're like, well, my fertility doctor told me that thyroid doesn't make a difference for, for my fertility. Like just, it was so clean. Like your, if your thyroid is not functioning properly, you're you're not going to ovulate properly like it was just yeah. a, just a simple linear process right so for everyone listening that alone is how important your thyroid is for your fertility and how much energy your ovaries need to function properly and to do what they need to do so i love yes. that piece i think that was really important for everybody to listen to and the other piece look you have six, I have five, you have six stages that you listed out of things that they can do. And of those six, four had to do with digestive function. <laughs> I know, right? First, everybody knows, right? Food, the food you eat, regulating your blood sugar, your gut and your liver all have digestive pieces to it. That shows you how important your food, your nutrition, your diet and your digestion are to your overall health fertility is no different. And it's why we all spend so much time talking about it. And you might be tired of hearing us talk about it, but if you're tired of hearing us talk about it, then do something about it. Yes. So, <laughs> so right? th those are of the six, four were all about that. And then stress has such a huge impact on everything else. And, you know, uh, it impacts your digestion too. Yeah, well, well, that's what yeah, I was just right? about to do. Like, I was even counting stress as part of the, you know, making it five things having to do with digestion. Because if you're if you're not eating properly, you can have nutritional stressors, um, dietary stressors, right? Like, they, it kind of all goes together. So it shows you how important those pieces are, and why actually these six steps are so valuable for everybody listening. I'm so glad you you reiterated that because I completely agree. And it's such a good connection that it's, you know, we know the problems. Like when you think about hormonal imbalances and fertility problems and period related issues, we actually know all of the issues. Like we know the problems, we know the causes, which means we know the solutions. And right. So it's just a matter of implementation. And I really encourage people to, you know, if they are struggling with making these changes, to really look at why that is, you know, why is, is it, is it that something in your life is currently still working? Is it still serving you in some way? You know, I think that we, we need to do, um, we need to do our due diligence on that. I think we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to our bodies and our health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we covered a lot of information for everybody and I know you gained a lot of knowledge just by listening to this interview and listening to Nicole talk about the importance of your menstrual cycle and period and ovulation and the six, six steps that you can take to actually take control of this yourself and really start to impact your overall health and your fertility and menstrual cycles. But if you really want to dive deep, then you've got to go out and get this book. And I say go out, you might not even be allowed to go out right now. But you can order it for sure on all your favorite resources like Amazon. Check it out. It's a wonderful resource. I think, Nicole, you've done a, a huge service to women in our society right now just to be able to educate them and hopefully allow them to, to not only gain more knowledge, but take more control over their periods and menstrual cycles. So thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much, Mark, for saying that. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. This was so fun. I love chatting with you.
Awesome. So everybody, thanks for watching. Thank you, Nicole. Tune into other episodes of Fertility TV. If you are not already a subscriber, then make sure you are by just hitting that bell. If you love this video, then give us a thumbs up. And if you've got any questions for Nicole or I, then just comment below and let us know. And we will do our best to get back to you and make sure you go out and check out her book. All right, everybody, until the next episode, stay fertile.